Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third Fetty Night Fight brought to you by the Federal Society Student Division and the Federal Society at Columbia Law School. Tonight's debate will concern the legal questions at issue in Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, which asks most basically whether a state can compel a Catholic foster care agency to consider placing children in same-sex couples. My name is Cole Campbell, and I'm the co-president of the Federal Society Student Chapter at Columbia Law School. I'm honored to be here tonight to introduce our fighters and our distinguished referee and what is sure to be a fiery but meaningful exchange of ideas on a matter of great importance to both parties and I hope to all of us. Now, tonight we intended to put on a debate with Columbia Law School's Professor Frankie, but about 30 minutes ago, Professor Frankie ran into an emergency situation that unfortunately is forecloses for her participation. But we, of course, still hope to put on an engaging event for you all who have taken the time to join us. So this event's going to be a little bit different. With very short notice, we are thrilled to welcome a different representative to fight in Professor Frankie's corner, UCLA Law School's Eugene Volick. <coughs> so in one corner, newly, we have Professor Eugene Volick, a professor of First Amendment law at the UCLA School of Law. Professor Volick clerked for Sandra Day O'Connor on the United States Supreme Court, and before that, for Alex Kaczynski on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Professor Bollock was born in the USSR and immigrated to the United States when he was just seven years old, and he went on to graduate from UCLA at the age of 15. And today, with about 15 minutes notice, he is going to be serving as Professor Lawrence's <coughs> And in the other corner, we have Jordan Lawrence, Senior, Count Senior Counsel and Director of Strategic Engagement with the Alliance Spending Freedom. His work concerns religious liberty, free speech, and the vindication of other important interests. He has argued before the United States Supreme Court and various other state Supreme Courts on behalf of his clients. Before joining ADF, Jordan earned his BA from Stanford University and his JD from the University of Minnesota Law School. He also worked for the Homeschool Legal Defense Association and the American Center for Law and Justice. And finally, we're pleased to welcome our referee, the Honorable Judge Jennifer Walker Elrod of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Judge Elrod was appointed to the Fifth Circuit in 2007, and before that, she served as a judge on the 190th District Court of Harris County, Texas, where she spent five years presiding over more than 200 trials. Judge Elrod earned her BA from Baylor University and her JD from Harvard Law School, where she was a member of the Harvard Federal Society. Judge Elrod serves on the advisory board for the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, and you might have seen her recent viral theatrical performance making the rounds on the internet with her and Judge Charles Eskridge's parody of Hamilton's We'll Be Back. And tonight, she'll be posing questions and ensuring a clean and fair fight. With that, I will throw it to our distinguished referee, Judge Elrod. Thank you, Cole, for that introduction. Thank you to the Federalist Society Student Division and Columbia Law Student Chapter for organizing this event. Thank you to Jordan Lawrence and Professor Eugene Volokh, who agreed to enter this ring, uh, Professor Volokh only just momentarily. And we wish Professor Frankie well um, as, um, as well. And thank you to all of you who are virtually attending tonight. We all look forward to a robust discussion rather than an actual fight. We will save time for questions and answers. And I encourage listeners to be thinking of things they would like to ask Jordan Lawrence, and Eugene Volokh. Tonight, of course, we will be discussing Fulton versus the City of Philadelphia, a case in which the Supreme Court recently held oral arguments. But before getting to that case, I want to mention two cases that I'm sure our speakers will be referring to. Knowing these cases is helpful background. The first is Employment Division versus Smith, a 1990 opinion authored by Justice Scalia, in which the plaintiffs in this case are asking the court to revisit. Smith held that neutral and generally applicable laws do not violate the free exercise clause of the First Amendment, even when they require or prohibit conduct in contravention of an individual's religious practice. The opinion held that religious exemptions do not need to be evaluated under strict scrutiny, a standard of review that would require the government to assert that the law burdens religious practices is, ju is justified by a compelling interest and the government has used the least restrictive means to further that interest. The other decision to keep in mind in this discussion is Obergefell. In Obergefell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court held that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment guarantees 
the right to marry as a fundamental liberty and that this is the same for same-sex couples as it is for opposite-sex couples. Chief Justice Roberts' first question at oral argument in Fulton asked about the tension between free exercise rights at issue in this case and the marriage equality rights in Obergefell. And tonight, I'm sure we will hear about both of these cases. Without further ado, we are going to begin the first round. And with the opening bell, Jordan Lawrence, you are up, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the oral arguments took place in this case the day after the election. And uh, I, I think there's probably a majority of the court that wants to rule in favor of Catholic social services. And I think that there's a way to do this in which uh, at least three major goals under existing legal doctrines where there's, uh, there is a maximized number of, of uh, families available to take foster children, that there is uh, same-sex couples have total opportunity. Every one of them who wants to apply to be a foster parent uh, will have opportunity to do so. And that also to protect and accommodate the religious convictions of Catholic social services in this. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of ways that they can do this under the Smith case. Now, maybe we can get into this later. I, I agree with those who think that the Supreme Court should overrule Employment Division v. Smith, but I don't think there didn't seem to be a lot of interest in doing that. And I think there's at least two ways that they can reach a, a very good result in all this. And one of the results I just want to say as well is, is that there can be peaceful coexistence between the supporters of same-sex marriage, those who are in same-sex marriages, and the people who believe uh, either by religious beliefs or philosophical beliefs, that marriage is defined only as one man and one woman. And uh, we had this, uh, how do we resolve that, come up in one context with Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop. Here is another uh, example of it. And I'm hoping we can reach out here. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about the facts of this case and what's going on this. So the Catholic Church has been, in Philadelphia, has been taking care of, of children in need for 200 years, that back in the 1790s, uh, they were caring for children whose parents had died in the yellow fever epidemic of the 1790s. And they just continued through the 1800s. And around 50 years ago, the city of Philadelphia started entering into this play, into this space of caring for children and partnered with some of the pre-existing groups that were already there, like Catholic Social Services, which started doing working with foster children and, and other orphans, et cetera, back in 1917. Now, the state's, uh, the government's role, the city of Philadelphia's role, has grown over the time. Now, the Catholic agency, <clears throat> of course, takes any child in need. It doesn't matter their race, their religion, their sexual orientation, their gender identity. They, they care for all of them. But uh, they do have religious beliefs because of their doctrine that they will not uh, certify a, a couple that is uh, unmarried or same sex. So I want to explain a little bit more how this system works and shows that I think that it has a pathway of solution here. So when a child is neglected or abused and comes into the custody of the, of the city of Philadelphia, it puts the word out to 30 agencies that it has contracted with and said, we've got these particular kids, you know, an eight-year-old boy, a six-year-old sister, um, they're this race, there's this religion. Um, who of you have families that can take them in? And these 30 agencies talk to their families and then put back to the city of Philadelphia offers of families that can take them. And then the city of Philadelphia decides taking factors like the race, the religion, the location of, uh, you know, for example, they want the kid to stay in the school that he's going to and chooses where the family goes. Now, that's the point where money starts changing hands, where the city of Philadelphia is paying these agencies for both the parents, the care of the kid, as well as the administration. The acquiring of the families is something that goes on beyond the contract. Now, these agencies have to do that so they have eligible families to take kids for placement. 
but that's all a different operation that's not controlled by the city and is and is, they have to meet criteria that are under state law. Now, what is very interesting about all of this is how I think there has been this uh, a number of referrals, this system, a culture of referring people to other agencies, because this is how the families get involved in this. If there's some family that thinking, we want to be a foster parent, they have to go through training, be investigated, certified uh, by these agencies. <clears throat> and the city says, go to one of these 30 agencies, investigate them, find the one that's the best fit, and then apply to them. Now, sometimes these families have unique skills or whatever, and they're not really aware of which agency would be the best one for them. So reading through the record, uh, and this didn't come out so much in the oral arguments, it was astonishing to me how much referring goes back and forth between these agencies. So there, it's, it's sort of a spontaneous ordering to maximize the efficiency of what's going on. So for example, uh, somebody can apply and they, they live too far away from the agency. So they'll be referred to one that's closer to them because these once these uh, families are certified and they get a child from the city, they have to work with them through the agency. It's not like the agency signs off. It's this very uh, intense, and frequent interaction between these agencies, the parents, the city, to make sure the child is getting the best care. Uh, the agency might have a waiting list. They'll refer someone to someone else. Uh, the applicant might wish to foster Native American children, which has special legal requirements, and there's some of these 30 groups specialize in that. The parents may speak a, a language other than English. So for example, there's two of these agencies that deal with Spanish speaking children, which would be uh, more helpful for children that speak Spanish to be put in a home where the foster parents can communicate with them. Uh, if there's, for example, the, the family has uh, medical expertise, they're both doctors, they're both nurses. Uh, there are some of these agencies that will specialize in groups that deal with uh, behavioral issues or medical issues and uh, other groups don't. And these agencies then will refer these parents to someone else. Pregnant teens is another one. Specialization, somebody's interested in that, they refer to, they happen to call the wrong agency, they'll get redirected to that. Now, what has happened with all of this is that this is specialization in service of efficiency. It has, uh, this spontaneous ordering has basically created a, um, a made, the, made this system more effective by maximizing the number of student, uh, uh, I'm sorry, number of families that can take foster children. It has allowed opportunities for any same sex couple that wants to apply to see if they qualify to be certified, they can do that. And also accommodates the beliefs of the Catholics. And I think it's a win, win, win. Now, what happened here was, is that the city found out that uh, they read in a newspaper article and some reporter asked Catholic Social Services, what would they do if a same-sex couple came? And they said, well, that's never happened. But if it did, if, if a same-sex couple came, we referred them to one of the other agencies. And there's at least three or four that uh, have gotten a, 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 a award from uh, various gay groups from the human rights campaign. And, and in fact, I'm not even sure that any of the other 29 say no to same-sex couples uh, or unmarried couples the way that the Catholics do. Uh, but this uh, caused alarm among various city officials. And so, uh, for example, the city council passed an ordinance that said, uh, that, that decrying this, and the city basically said, we're going to put a, uh, into our contract a non-discrimination policy, which the Catholics said we could not in faith do, and they were cut off from receiving any more children. Now there were already children uh, in foster care with families that were associated with uh, uh, Catholic social services and they continue, but those numbers are dwindling. Yet, even at this time, the, the, the city of Philadelphia put out a public call for 300 new households uh, to take foster kids 
at the same time when they were cutting off Catholic social services. Now, how does the how how does the Supreme Court fit that into current doctrine? Now they could uh, get uh, overrule Employment Division v. Smith, so that the city would have to have a compelling governmental interest done by the least restrictive means to do this. I don't think they're going to go that far in this case. But there are two other things that I think that they could do. They they could choose, and maybe right now they're weighing those. One of them is hostility towards religion. In Masterpiece Cake Shop, this is a case that uh, where I work, Alliance of Any Freedom did, the Supreme Court resolved the free, uh, the free exercise issue by pointing to uh, the, the comments made by members of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission that were negative about the religious beliefs of Jack Phillips. And they basically said uh, that that was not a basis that they could rule against him and reverse that ruling. Here we have something similar going on. The city council passed an ordinance that said, uh, I'm sorry, a a resolution that said that what Catholic social services are doing is discrimination taking place under the guise of religious freedom. uh, The mayor had the Philadelphia Commission on Human Rights open an investigation against Catholic social services, but that didn't come to anything. And then the commissioner who deals with the foster children came to Catholic social services and tried to say, look, uh, this isn't a hundred years ago. You got to change your ways and pointed them to the teachings of Pope Francis and said, why can't you be more like him? And what I think this isn't maybe necessarily hostility, but at least raises eyebrows to have a government official telling uh, someone in a Catholic organization that they're not interpreting their own church's doctrine and theology the right way. It, it, uh, maybe there's some establishment clause problems there. Now, the other way, and I think that this may be the way that they do this, is that the Smith decision says that if the law is neutral on its face towards religion and generally applicable, then you can't bring a free exercise clause. So it's not neutral if you have negative statements being made by the government officials. But it's also, Smith says, it's also not generally applicable if there is a system of individualized assessments that go on of evaluating uh, people or institutions on a case-by-case basis to decide that. And I think we have this here. So even the contract provision itself that says no discrimination has, uh, unless there is a waiver done by the commissioner. There's also a general committee that they have that waives uh, contract provisions that people can apply to do this. Now, the exemptions here, I think that they have to justify why the system that worked before, where there was all this spontaneous ordering, this self-selection, where uh, maximizing the number of children that had foster homes, uh, the homes for foster children that allowed same-sex couples to, all that wanted to could apply, as well as accommodating the Catholics' beliefs that that did not work, that they had to come in and say, basically, every person has got to be able to apply to any one of the 30 agencies. But then they're still allowing all this uh, referring by the groups to others because it just would not be efficient for them just to say, I'm whatever family randomly d- decides to apply to one group that they're stuck with them, that they cannot refer people to maximize the su- sufficiency. So I just think in this instance here, with this situation, what was existing prior to what city of Philadelphia did when they imposed this order in 2018 was a system that worked. And by what they have done now is they've eliminated one of their providers for foster care. So children have to uh, languish in group homes because willing parents are not being allowed to do it unless they, and if you think, well, why don't they go to one of the other 29 agencies? They would have to start from the very uh, square one to be qualified to be able to do that. This is, Philadelphia has basically tried to solve a problem that did not exist. And I think the solution would be to go back to the way it was because it was working efficiently 
and no one was being discriminated against. And I think that that's the promise of Obergefell and Masterpiece Cake Shop. How do we have peaceful coexistence and mutual dignity between these groups? And that's what was happening in Philadelphia before the city stepped in. Thank you, Jordan. Eugene? Yeah, so uh, Philadelphia has a job to do. It has what is these days at least perceived as a government function. If, par if children end up without parents, they need to place them uh, in some home or uh, through foster care. That's an important government function. Philadelphia could, if it wanted to, perform this function itself using its own employees. It could just say, you know, if there's a child who's orphaned, let's say, we're going to try to line up somebody. And we have a staff of people who, who do that, uh, who screen uh, uh, prospective parents. And of course, we'll tell our staff that they shouldn't discriminate based on certain criteria. Um, that's, that would be our policy. Maybe it's a good policy, maybe it's a bad policy. It's our choice, it's our discretion. If that were so, then it's pretty clear that uh, uh, religious entities or secular entities that say, no, 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 we want to help administer this program, they'd be out of court. They don't have, nobody has a right to participate in this kind of government program. But for, I think, pretty good reasons, um, the city decided to uh, essentially hire out, not on an, an, an employment basis, but kind of on a contract basis, hire out this function to nonprofits, many of whom, for example, have very good connections with various communities, uh, may be particularly uh, good at, uh, as Jordan pointed out, at screening people in particular, uh, uh, particular ways. But uh, the city takes the view that it, um, uh, that it, uh, 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 should insist that those groups also, generally speaking, not discriminate. Maybe it's a short-sighted view. Maybe it's uh, too zealous in the pursuit of non-discrimination above all. Maybe the maybe some amount of toleration of discrimination coupled with referrals would be a more sensible approach. Maybe, but it seems to me that that is a, a judgment that the Constitution and the Free Exercise Clause leaves to the city. That the city is entitled. Uh, to say, if you want to participate in this program, then if you want, if you want us to listen to you when you tell us, oh, we think this couple is good uh, for this child, and we this couple we aren't willing to certify. If you want to listen to us, you got to play by our rules. And if you don't want to play by our rules, that's fine. You can provide lots of other services. Uh, just you won't get this uh, very unusual factor of participation. Uh, in, uh, uh, in this decision about who gets to foster parent. Uh, so so that's, that's what the city of Philadelphia is doing here. And I don't think that the free exercise clause stands in its way in this context. Now, to be sure, uh, this formal non-discrimination rule appears to have been implemented recently, but that's in part because especially when it comes to government running its own programs, it often starts with a limited set of rules and then when things that trouble it arise, that's when it enacts, enacts new rules. So it may be that beforehand it hadn't really focused on it. Maybe it just assumed that various entities wouldn't discriminate or it just wasn't top of its list. But now that it sees that there is this discrimination that uh, is apparently happening. And by the way, my view is it's a, not a terribly harmful form of discrimination. Maybe it's the sort of discrimination that should that entities should be allowed to engage in, but that's not the city's view. Uh, in running its program, it concludes it wants to basically eliminate such discrimination, except in a very, very few contexts. Um, so what about the fact that uh, uh, the city seems to be hostile to something here? I do think the city is hostile to something, but I don't see any reason to think that it's hostile to Catholicism. It is hostile to particular practice that is associated with at least people who believe in a particular um, uh, type of, uh, of Catholicism, the practice of preference for traditional marriage over non-marital couples or same-sex marriage. Uh, that is a practice that is entitled to be hostile to. It's the job of the government to decide which behavior that may have secular effects is something that it 
approves of or disapproves of. Now, there are some constraints on that, maybe in some situations. I mean, for example, if the city were to say, no, you cannot discriminate based on sex in whom you marry. Well, that would be pretty ridiculous. No city tries to do that, uh, but it would violate the right to marry. And uh, so, so therefore, uh, the city can't Im impose its non-discrimination rules in that situation. But I think it can impose its non-discrimination rules on those who want to engage in this kind of city delegated authority to make these kinds of decisions about the qualities of couples. And if in the process it's hostile to a view that opposite sex marriage is the only uh, uh, a kind of couple that, that is worthy uh, then, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, parenting children, that it's entitled to implement that hostility into its rules. Because again, it's hostility to a practice. It's kind of like in Employment Division versus Smith. Was the state of Oregon hostile to something? Yes, it was hostile to peyote use. But that wasn't enough to make that practice to religiously discriminatory in uh, um, uh, the Supreme Court's views, because it wasn't hostility to the peyote churches as such. It was just disapproval of a particular practice that secular as well as religious people may engage in. Um, so if you think about it, by the way, this issue comes up in a wide, wide range of contexts, right? If a city as employer wants to hire its hire employees, it may be required. It, it may require them to do certain things, um, and uh, uh, there are there are limits on that imposed by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. That there is a not strict scrutiny of government action that burdens employees' religious practice, just the uh, uh, the uh, requirement of reasonable accommodation. But that's a statutory choice. Uh, that uh, Congress enacted through, through Title VII. Likewise, there's a Pennsylvania statute, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which involved Pennsylvania's legislature imposing um, uh, 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 certain extra restraints on governments. But that's not before the court right now for reasons we can talk about later. Uh, the Constitution doesn't require the state to hire or government entities to hire people. Uh, and at the same time, uh, tolerate those people's religious practices, religiously motivated practices, when they violate secular norms that the uh, government as employer prescribes. It seems to me the same rule would apply uh, to the government, uh, uh, government when it's contracting things out. I know there are particular details we can talk about, about how, what the uh, relevance is of certain exemptions for disability discrimination, very narrow exceptions for race discriminations. I will say, uh, uh, we can talk about them in the Q&A, but I think that probably most people aren't terribly interested in that. I will close with two things. One is when Employment Division versus Smith uh, uh, talked about how there is a remnant of free act of, uh, of uh, 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 requirement of kind of religious exemptions under the free exercise clause. It was pointing to cases which involved individualized governmental assessment of the reasons for the relevant conduct. That's an employment compensation where basically you're entitled to collect unemployment compensation when you leave your job for good reason and when you, dec and when you are open to other jobs, but declined to take some other proposed job for good reason. And the court said in that context, when there's a pretty free form determination, what's good reason? Oh, it's too far away from you. Oh, it interferes with childcare responsibilities. Oh, you're overqualified for it. Oh, you're underqualified for it. Uh, if this is kind of a case by case determination of good reason, well, religious reasons ought to be treated the same way. I think that's pretty far from what's going on here, whereas a general matter with very, very few exceptions, uh, there is this non-discrimination rule, at least as I understand it. So let's just step back and summarize. This is the government deciding how to run its programs. Uh, sometimes it makes those decisions wisely, sometimes unwisely, sometimes counterproductively. I'm perfectly willing to except the government sometimes does that, maybe it's doing it here. Maybe again, it's too obsessed with non-discrimination above all, but it's running its own programs. It's giving programs that give entities like Catholic Social Services uh, rights to, to participate in a governmental process that the rest of us don't have. So if, if I were to say, oh, I want to go and, uh, and help decide who's going to be a suitable foster parent and say, well, okay, you know, you're not part of this program. Maybe you could apply for it, but there's no reason we particularly would need to let you in. And certainly 
as an ordinary citizen, you're not entitled to get access to it. So, so uh, in this kind of context, the city ought to be able to say, you want us to listen to you? You want us to give kind of legal effect to your decisions? Got to play by our rules. And that, it seems to me, is something that the free exercise clause, certainly under Employment Division versus Smith, uh, uh, allows the city to do. Thank you, Eugene. Jordan? Uh, I guess I'm a little surprised at how deferential uh, Eugene is being to the government here that uh, uh, that uh, this is a function. I mean, just for just sort of the general libertarian philosophy, I thought there would be a little more warmth to what I was saying with with all of this. But but I think that uh, I I don't I dispute your characterization of this is that this is something that the government has been, you know, they're, they're, they're obviously in control now and they're setting the rules. But for decades, they basically did not occupy this space and they allowed the private groups to do it. And then in the last 50 years, uh, this started out as a partnership and it's been sort of a takeover of this. And maybe that's appropriate, but... Uh, the, the Catholics are not these Johnny come latelys that have come to this and are demanding special treatment that nobody else gets. It's basically the government coming in and forcing a rule that uh, basically messes up a system that already worked. Now, constitutionally, too, I'm thinking of uh, the, the hobby case, not Hobby Lobby, but a hobby case from uh, I think like around 1986, where the Supreme Court said there is a duty to accommodate religious beliefs. And I think if you have government expanding into more and more areas, that there's a cor correlative duty for the government to accommodate. So like, uh, you know, religious pacifists have no conflict with the government until there's a military draft. Uh, the uh, Hobby Lobby and, and uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor don't have any conflict until Obamacare comes on the scene. And, and, and so I, I just think that if, if you kind of start at the point where the government is taken over and saying, hey, they're just having neutral rules, I, I, I think that that's not the right place to start. And, that it, and it just means that the religious users are always going to lose in, in that kind of situation. They never have to be accommodated because, and that's what I see as the main problem with Employment Division v. Smith, is that these uh, the, the government, uh, then even if they have reasons that are not significant, they always win in these kind of situations. So uh, I am libertarian-ish <laughs> as a matter of policy, uh, but I don't think the free exercise clause enacts a libertarian vision of religious exemptions. That is, in fact, what the court held in Employment Division versus Smith, controversially to be sure, but that is what it held. Uh, so uh, that is especially so, it seems to me, when again, it's the government running government programs. It's not the government sort of telling people what they can do in their own homes or even in their own businesses. It's saying, again, if you want us to listen to you in your judgment about who is a fit foster parent, we want you to follow certain rules. Now, it is true that foster parenting historically had often been arranged through religious entities, and I think it's very much to their credit. Nonetheless, uh, this is something that is understandably viewed, certainly today, as a government function. Again, we're not talking about, in foster parenting, about people controlling their own lives. We're talking about who gets to control other people's lives, little people's lives, mm -hmm. right? So if you have parent, if you have children whose parents are dead or parents are unable to help them, then uh, the law, by putting them in a foster home, is giving these foster parents power over these children in certain measure. And unsurprisingly, modern government takes the view that we should help decide uh, who, who it is. So in fact, we should have the ultimate decision-making power on who it is. Who, who has this, because they'll only have access to these children. They only have this power because the law allows them to do that. Uh, so it seems to me quite reasonable that this should be an area where the government ought to have a considerable amount of freedom. 
uh, uh, shouldn't freedom, let me be more spe specific, considerable amount of latitude in deciding again whom it listens to in making these picks. Finally, let me just close with Employment Division versus Smith because now that we are at this question of whether it should be overruled, let me just close with one hypothetical. And uh, uh, I think we'll have plenty of time to explore it. Jordan, I'd love to hear your thoughts probably mm -hmm. during Q&A and I think students may answer it too. Um, back in the late 1990s, in 1997, I think, the Supreme Court dealt with in fact a libertarian claim, a claim of our right to assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court rejected that claim. And it said among other things that this is subject to the rational basis test, not subject to strict scrutiny, because deciding whether to allow assisted suicide involves very contested and difficult moral questions and difficult practical questions. When is life valuable? Is it all life that's valuable or only life of people who want to keep on living that's, that is valuable enough, more specifically, for the mm -hmm. government to, uh, to, to protect through the threat of criminal sanctions for those who want to help end it? Also, even if you say, uh, well, uh, um, uh, if somebody really wants to die, they should be entitled to do that. There are questions about how we sort those who really want to die from those who don't. So there's a practical question of whether these least res less restrictive means uh, are going to be effective. That too is a difficult and contested question. And the Supreme Court said, look, uh, we know we've recognized some libertarian rights under the rubric of substantive due process. We're not, we don't really want to grow this category much. The constitution does not enact a broadly libertarian system where people are free to do uh, what they wish or even what they wish so long as it doesn't hurt others. Uh, it's left to the legislative process. So the interesting thing is if we were in a Sherbert v. Werner world, a pre-employment division versus Smith world or other world that lasted from 60, 1963 to about 19, to, to 1990 mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, the people who wanted to either Help, be helped commit suicide or to help others commit suicide had a religious claim, kind of like we want to be good Samaritans or the Samaritans who help those who want to die, help them die. Then all of these difficult moral and pragmatic questions that the court managed, I think quite correctly, Doc in Washington v. Glucksburg, it would have to consider just as to religious objectors because the religious objectors would presumably have this presumptive right under the free exercise clause as a constitutional matter, not just as a statutory matter, not overcomable by the legislature, just as a constitutional matter. And that's, that's not just that, it's as to employment discrimination laws and minimum wage laws and a vast range of other laws where somebody, uh, where the court says, we're gonna avoid all of these problems of making these moral and pragmatic judgments by leaving it to the rational basis test and therefore for the political process, all of those, the duty to, or, or claims of a right to refuse to testify on religious grounds, all of those would be returned to the courts to decide at least when somebody is making a religious objection. I think that's something the court rightly avoided with Employment Division versus Smith, and I don't think it, it should want to go back into that business again. Well, the, the, uh, let me just add one thing here just quickly, is, is that I think that, and I mean, you raised some excellent points, but I think the more likely scenario is I can see a future administration uh, taking over the medical system and saying there's a right to assisted suicide and basically saying to doctors and nurses employed by the government run healthcare system that if you don't participate in this, you lose your jobs. And you have, you know, this is a general rule uh, that applies to everybody and uh, uh, we're going to grant no religious accommodation. And so I, I, I think that that's kind of the, uh, I mean, that's a different scenario than what you're talking about. But I think that is something that when government grows, we shouldn't have religious liberty shrink or right of conscience shrink. But if the government really is an employer there, then of course the government can say to doctors and hospitals, uh, at least consistent with the free exercise clause, if you want to be hired at our hospital, then you've got to you've got to perform the operations we want you to hire, uh, but we want you to hire, we're hiring you uh, mm -hmm. to do. Now, again, Title VII is a judgment by Congress that there ought to be a modest, not strict scrutiny, but a modest uh, level of exemption from that, but that's a statutory choice. I don't think the constitution should demand that. So Eugene, just wanna make sure I got this right. If the government goes into a sphere 
and dominates the sphere and takes it over, then it can have any rules it likes, even if they burden religious people. So if they take over all the hospitals, they can have, uh, this was a hypo at the actual at the actual argument, I think that Justice Barrett asked, and she didn't ask it about assisted suicide. I think she asked it about abortion, right. requiring every doctor in the hospital system to perform abortions or certain percentage of them or something. Uh, and then would this be discriminatory against Catholics? Um, the same thing for schools. This, if the, the more that the government decides to decide we're going to run all the grocery stores and we're going to run all of the, the you know, the government's going to run the entire economy. We're going to be a centrally planned country. Does that mean that the government then can have all of these rules then? And that w- where do religious people's rights kick in, in do, under this theory? So... Let's look at Employment Division versus Smith. There, the government didn't even really have, at least the way the court conceptualized the case, a hook of the government as employer or government as contractor. There, the government had a law that made it a crime to use peyote. Just a crime. And by the way, throughout early American history, there were no drug laws. My understanding is they're generally a creature of the early 1900s. To be sure, at the state level, there were some alcohol bans, but certain, but uh, uh, pervasively, they didn't come around until the early 1900s. And Justice Scalia's response was, well, maybe uh, that the government has now, he didn't even articulate as taking over the field, they're just creating criminal laws to ban things that before were not banned. Uh, but it's entitled to do that, and nobody gets an exemption from that. Um, so, so under Employment Division versus Smith, uh, if the government can criminalize the use of peyote, then yes, if the government is actually taking over some field and actually running it itself, then in that case, it's even clearer it can, as a condition of employment or condition of contract, so impose the same the same rules. Now, one thing that I think is important about this field is, again, this isn't like the government just saying, I'm going to take over grocery stores. It's the government saying, we're going to take over the decision about who is going to have custody, who other than the the birth parents is going to have custody of a child. That is quite suitably a government decision. That is a decision that understandably, it's the government and not just some third party that's going to be making. So I think this is a particularly sensible place for the government to to say that. But yes, under Employment Division versus Smith, the government doesn't have to be limited to its authority as employer or as contractor. It can can impose criminal laws. Now, what's the constraint on that? Justice Scalia was asked that essentially. And in the, the Smith opinion, he said the constraint is the political process that uh, there could be religious exemptions obtained. And in fact, it has turned out that uh, one way or another, most American jurisdictions, including Pennsylvania, have statutes like the Religious Freedom Administration Acts, which I actually support precisely because they're not constitutional mandates, but rather statutory mandates subject to revision the way statutes are, where religious objectors do have such exemptions. Likewise, Congress enacted in Title VII an exemption for employees even of private businesses, which have been taken which employees have taken advantage, for example, of uh, uh, in uh, saying, you know, I don't want to participate in abort, performing abortions. And there are special statutes that actually pr- protect specifically employees that do not want to perform abortions. So I think that's rightly left to the political process. Let's just step back a little bit more broadly. What about, what about this religious person who feels I have a religious obligation to participate in assisted suicide? I think the general answer is, okay, that's your your felt religious obligation. We understand that. But if we have a generally applicable law forbidding assisted suicide, we don't have to give you a special exemption just because you believe it's really, really, really wrong. That is to say, the law is really, really, really wrong. I think that's the premise of Employment Division versus Smith, and I think it's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Jordan, did you want to respond? I do have a question for you, too. I'm not just... Well, Eugene. I, 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 would, I would say, though that that there is kind of an implicit uh, standard of, maybe it's not a compelling state interest, but of some significant state interest. So somebody says, I have a religious belief that I have to participate in uh, assisted suicide. Uh, That would be similar to somebody says, I have a belief that it's a sin to pay taxes. And the governmental interest uh, is at a point where they can say, look, uh, we cannot allow uh, exemptions from this general rule. 
But in other situations, I think the government imposes rules out of convenience. Uh, their, their interests are not that significant, uh, that sort of thing. And that it is good for them to be put to the test to why they're not granting an exemption to somebody who disapproves of, of the situation. And I would say in this, choice, it, it, this situation, even though we're talking about custody of children, uh, th there's all sorts of the factors that the government says are illegal when they're placing the children, the race, their, their uh, religion, things like this, the marital status of the couples, all these things that they say, the city says, we are bound not to do that. They employ all those all the time. And so I think, well, then why can't you grant an exemption? And in fact, when this system was working before you imposed this in 2018, we had efficiency. We had, uh, it seems like a least restrictive means. It's not like, and it would have been a different situation if there were all sorts of same-sex couples that lacked the opportunity to apply to be foster care, uh, foster parents, but, but, they, but they were able to do it. So I'm not I don't understand what their governmental interest is that they were trying to fix, except a very generalized statement about uh, avoiding discrimination, which I think at one level wasn't even happening here because no same-sex couple was denied the ability to apply to be a, uh, a foster parent. Well, you know, we haven't talked about the stigma to yet in this discussion. We've been talking about government power and what's the government sphere. But um, during this argument, during the argument in the Supreme Court, um, there was some lengthy discussion and questioning about the Loving case. In the lead up to the Loving to Loving v. Virginia, people from several faith traditions made religious arguments against interracial marriage. And an oral argument in this case. Um, several justices questioned whether this case would be different if the agency refused to certify interracial couples as foster parents on religious grounds. Would a ruling in CSS's favor in this case set the stage for such a result? How would you distinguish the loving hypothetical? Or can you? That's a question for you, Jordan. Well, I, I, I would say this, is that, um, first of all, it hasn't happened. And uh, if it did happen, uh, I think that the government could say something like uh, race is unique with the badges and incidents of slavery under the 13th Amendment, uh, that it might be different. But I would say this, too, is that even the governmental's interest for race is not an uh, interest uh, uh, sufficient to suppress, for example, freedom of speech rights. Now, how this would play out, I don't know, but somebody can inflict serious dignitary harm on black people with what they say, and that doesn't give the government an excuse to censor them. But the other thing too is, is that in Obergefell itself, the uh, Justice Kennedy characterized, uh, this is, he said this, the many who deem same-sex marriage to be wrong reach that conclusion based on decent and honorable religious or philosophical premises, and neither they nor their beliefs are disparaged here. And there's not a statement like that about uh, uh, people who believe interracial marriage is wrong. And in fact, I would say in light of Masterpiece, there's more of a uh, uh, the, the, the last sentence of the Masterpiece decision, Justice Kennedy is saying, looking for a balance where we can have peaceful coexistence between those who are in same-sex marriages and believe in it with those who believe marriage is limited to one man and one woman. And I think that this is what they had in Philadelphia before the rule was imposed was a, baseful, a basically a peaceful coexistence. So my just quick response is, I do think that people have the right to discriminate in, in various ways in certain contexts. We see that in Boy Scouts v. Dale. We see that in Hurley, the parade case. I'm, I'm all, all in favor of that when they're just doing it themselves. But when the government is operating a program and is selecting people who participate in the program and is using contractors or its own employees, again, I think this is interchangeable here, uh, to administer the program, you could say, we don't want to do anything that causes even a modest amount of stigma or more to the point, 
whether it causes stigma or not. We just don't want to do anything, perhaps with a few narrow exceptions, that discriminates based on certain on certain criteria. Again, it's something it could insist that its staff do if it operates this program through its staff. I think it's something it could insist its contractors uh, do. And uh, I think it can do that quite consistently with the language from a burger phone. I do think that, for example, a, a wedding photographer, I've filed a brief in one such case, unfortunately, unpersuasively to the court, but- uh, My case. Pardon? <laughs> It was yes. my case, yes. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, that a wedding photographer should be free not to create uh, uh, same-sex wedding photographs. I'll go further. If a wedding photographer doesn't want to create wedding uh, ph photographs of interracial weddings, she should be free not to do that. My wife and I, uh, 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 I, I'm Jewish, she's not. Some photographers may view that as kind of impermissible intermarriage, probably more likely Jewish, some Jewish photographers rather than non-Jewish ones. And if one of them told me, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to photograph your wedding, I think they'd have every right to do that. But if the government decided it wanted to provide subsidized photographs or as part of, let's say, the UC uh, system, it have photographs of UC faculty members' weddings, then it could insist that the photographers it hires for that particular task uh, uh, go along with its rules. Your judge, I think you are muted. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I think you've acquitted yourself very well in this in this pseudo boxing match. I want and all yet... judges to feel that I'm acquitted. <laughs> <laughs> no promises there, Eugene. Uh, no. um, um, we're now going to open the conversation up to the audience. Um, and so I hope you don't take any blows from them, but you will that they will be asking some questions. I do have some some instructions for you, audience members. If you're on the phone, you need to dial star nine. If you're on in the ch uh, chat feature, you should raise your hand. We have a couple of hand raises in the chat feature. I will call on you. I do ask that you make your questions brief. A uh, fair warning, I will cut you off if you give a speech instead of ask a question. And I have no, um, you're warned, And um, but we, we do appreciate your questions. We'll begin with Sean Callahan, who's had, Sean's had his hand, his or her hand up for a long time. Hello, thank you, Judge. Uh, my question is whether uh, Smith can be overruled or at least conformed to uh, Yoder through Lukumi by revivifying the sincerely held religious belief tests. I think it's commonly supposed that the rationale for Smith is that judges can't possibly say uh, whose uh, beliefs are sincere. I think it's more that judges don't want to say what beliefs are religious, but is it really true under the original public meaning of the First Amendment, that uh, we can't say whether a belief in killing yourself is a religious belief or other similar such determinations? Well, my view is that the, the uh, current law allows the government to decide what's a sincere belief and what's not. In fact, requires it under various rifras. Yes. But what it can't decide is whether the belief is central to a religion or is true religion, and it also can't reject beliefs because they're unfamiliar or, uh, uh, or kind of parts of a very small religious beliefs or even are idiosyncratic. Uh, so there are debates about the original public meaning of the free exercise clause and whether it's more like Smith or more like Sherbert or maybe more like something in between. But I see no way in which a court can say, you believe that the parable of the Good Samaritan means you should help kill people who seek death, seek a mercy killing? No, no, that's, you're clearly lying. Doesn't matter how sincere you seem, doesn't matter what other people testify that you're sincere, you must be lying. Or even if you're not lying, that's just wrong. That's just not a religious belief. I can't see how that would be so. Now, it may not be the standard way that most Christians would interpret the parable of the Good Samaritan, but doesn't have to be. In fact, I think one as feature of the establishment clause is the government can say this is true Christianity or this is really popular Christianity that is said something a lot of people believe in and that's something therefore we would prefer over something that is weird or or idiosyncratic. So yes, 
it seems to me that while you can use the substantial burden threshold to get rid of cases where the person is making stuff up in a way that you can say, at least by preponderance of the evidence, I think he's lying. But you can't get rid of claims because they're somehow inconvenient or they're unusual or they're contrary to the judge's own view of what religion ought to be. Jordan, can I just have- add, I, 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 I agree with what Eugene is saying. And I would say that uh, if, is, if the religion seems to be a pretext, so for example, I think that that comes up in some financial fraud situations where somebody, they're purporting that it's religious but they're just basically doing some kind of thing to, you know, get tax benefits or whatever and setting up a, you know, a fake church and their name's Bob and they set up the church of Bob or something like that, that that's where the sincerity issue comes in. And, uh, and I, I agree, you don't judge uh, the centrality. I think you can judge the sincerity, but I don't think that's usually the issue. It's, uh, uh, the compelling state interest and the least restrictive means is, is usually, uh, and, and the substantial burden. Those are the factors that are usually at issue in religious liberty cases and free exercise cases. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Next question comes from Tori Rhodes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Judge. Um, please tell me if I'm completely off base, but when I was hearing Professor uh, Eugene, I was thinking and wondering if from the government's perspective, can their opposition be likened to something similar to a baston and peremptory challenge that as a private actor participating in a government program, um, they could be viewed as a state actor for equal protection mm-hmm. purposes, meaning that the private actor is discriminating not on the basis of sexual orientation, but because of the same sex. Interesting, interesting. So the question is whether it would be constitutionally compelled under the Equal Protection Clause for the government to uh, uh, insist that anybody participating in this foster care process, uh, uh, foster care screening process, uh, not discriminate. It's an interesting question. I think the Batson cases are uh, are kind of they're, they're pushing the boundaries of what is. Uh, uh, of what is state action. Uh, I, uh, uh, even if, if they're correct, I don't think that, that the court is likely to, to go considerably beyond them. I think if a city were to say, look, we will allow screening by, uh, uh, by entities, even without any non-discrimination rule, so long as they're willing to refer people so that, so that every couple will get somebody who'd be willing to screen them. I think that, that would be within its authority. I don't think it's it, that would violate the Equal Protection Clause for the city to take a hands-off approach to that. Uh, but I do think that the city is entitled to take a hands-on approach. And again, one way of thinking about it is if this were all done by government employees and the, and the manager of the program says sends out a memo saying, all of you folks who are being paid in order to to run this program, I'm telling you, you have to follow these rules. Seems to me that would be constitutional. And the fact that it's being done through contractors, I don't think changes the analysis. Jordan, did you have anything to add? Well, I, I would just add that the uh, <clears throat> that the the city of Philadelphia has never claimed that the contractor, the contracting agencies are state actors, that that has not been their argument. In fact, that they've said we have nothing to do with the uh, you know, the recruiting and in- investigative process to certify the foster parents. They're not liable for any problems they do, that sort of thing. So there's much more of a hands-off approach here that they have with this kind of situation. Right. And actually, if I just mention one thing, just because this is doctrine and it's good for good for law students to appreciate the value of, of doctrine, I actually think there is a binding precedent, more or less, on this broad question. Or I shouldn't say binding precedent, precedents that bear on this question. We know from a case called Rendell Baker versus Cohn that when the government is um, uh, even paying 90% of the, um, uh, of the budget of a private contractor, it is not, does not make the private contractor a state actor. In that case, it was a, it was a, uh, um, a school for children, I forget, with some kinds of problems. And it was very heavily subsidized by the state, but it was not actually run by the state. And a teacher, I think, sued saying her First Amendment rights were violated by the school. Court says that's not a state actor. On the other hand, you have Bob Jones University versus uh, uh, 
uh, versus United States, where the government says we're going to deny tax exemption, which is a form of subsidy, to institutions that discriminate based on race. And the court there upheld that under strict scrutiny. Uh, and in Employment Division versus Smith, the court actually gave Bob Jones as an example of a kind of case where under the Employment Division versus Smith there rule there shouldn't be any um, uh, any heightened scrutiny. Now you can debate whether the result, uh, whether Smith is right, of course, on, uh, uh, on, on this, but the important point is there are a lot of situations where the government doesn't have to enforce non-discrimination rules uh, because there's no state action, but is entitled to if it wants to. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Corbin Kaufman. Uh, yes, I was curious about for the religious animus argument under Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um, my understanding is that the, both the district court and the Third Circuit have already kind of analyzed factually elements of animus. So I was wondering what you expect the court might do on that front, remanding for more factual hearings or sort of looking at the facts themselves or well, how, how should they treat the facts in that regard under the, the Masterpiece Cake Shop argument? Jordan, you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. Is um, This is just my gut feel from listening a couple of times. I listened twice to the oral arguments straight through. I think they're going to be more, I think that's possible that they could say, hey, we said religious animus in uh, a Masterpiece Cake Shop. This is kind of similar and rule in favor of Catholic Social Services on that grounds. My hunch is, though, I think they're going to be more attracted to the, the fact that there's a lot of individualized exemption, uh, exemptions in this built into this system. There's a lot of, uh, you know, just basically making decisions on, you know, uh, on a case by case basis, uh, that that sort of thing, which will be the basis that they if they rule in favor of Catholic social services, I think that's going to be the grounds that they're going to take. Yeah, I, I generally agree with the if uh, uh, part, and more broadly, I think that uh, uh, that the evidence here of of real religious animus is just not uh, uh, not strong enough, especially given that indeed the district court essentially said, you know, the, and the, the presence of animus is a factual matter. Said this is there's uh, a not sufficient evidence. And that brings up you're talking about what you think the opinion will say. If you could write the opinion, and this was your world, what would the opinion say? And if the decision were to come out opposite of the way you would want it to, what would you foresee as the worst consequences of the decision? Jordan, you want to start? Well, if, if I, I, I would, if I were to write the decision, I would either, you know, depend if I get four other votes, was to overturn Employment Division v. Smith and apply the compelling state interest test, or as I laid out at the beginning, rule that this was an in, there was a lot of individualized exceptions here, and that they basically had a working system that basically did not result in discrimination against same-sex couples, and that that's what they should return to, and that, and, and that it also maximized the number of families available for foster children and accommodated the religious beliefs of the Catholics. Uh, what I think is the con what what is the consequence, and with cases like Masterpiece Cake Shop, I do think that there's sort of this continuum of how much uh, it, it, you know we, we see more and more people accepting the notion of uh, uh, same sex marriage. People that believe in the traditional view of marriage are diminishing, and how much ostracism can the government impose on those who believe the wrong way? So um, if we lose this, I think it would be kind of more like, what's the next step? Is it going to be families who believe marriage is one man and one woman? They cannot apply to be foster parents. Uh, you know, uh, nonprofit groups like churches that say, we believe marriage is only one man and one woman. They lose their tax exempt status because we shouldn't be subsidizing discrimination or something like that. And I feel that cases like Masterpiece and a win here for Catholic services 
basically creates safe space for people who have the minority position. And I think it's I, just as a general First Amendment matter, it's good to carve out those enclaves to protect those who have the minority view. And if the those in control with the prevailing orthodoxy can just say, well, we're going to call you discriminators and just kind of wipe you out. You know, we're going to we're going to uh, uh, file bar complaints against all the attorneys at Alliance Defending Freedom to, you know, revoke their licenses to practice law, you know, things like that. That sort of thing should not be allowed to happen. And I think that there will be uh, incentivized if the case goes the wrong way. Um, can I share the screen for just a moment? Because I've got the opening paragraph all written up already. <laughs> so it's right here. This and is, you, this you is, came on in 15 minutes yes, notice. That's pretty impressive. impressive that you, well, uh, you're filling in and you've written an opening paragraph. Uh, this is the opening paragraph of my amicus brief in the case. So Justice Scalia was right. Courts should not be constantly in the business of determining whether the severe impact of various laws and religious practice suffices to justify constitutionally required religious exemptions from a generally applicable law. It is horrible to contemplate that federal judges will regularly balance against the importance of general laws, the significance of religious practice in determining whether constitution mandates an exemption from a general state law. And then I would give some of the illustrations just like Justice Scalia gave in my brief. I mentioned, uh, Again, assisted suicide laws uh, or claims of religious exemptions from the duty to testify. Um, uh, uh, some Jews, for example, uh, take the view that uh, they cannot testify against their parents or children. Some Muslims have um, uh, have taken the view that they can't testify when they think that would serve injustice or can't testify against the fellow Muslim. These are all sincere religious beliefs. They cannot be something that trumps um, uh, generally applicable law as a constitutional matter, and the government can't, uh, uh, excuse me, and the courts have no yardstick by which to decide that. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that, of course, um, uh, uh, government entities, uh, uh, or let's say states and the federal government as to federal law, uh, is entitled uh, to uh, um, uh, uh, carve out uh, religious exemptions so long as they're suitably neutral. And in fact, Pennsylvania RIFRA has done that. In it, the Pennsylvania legislature ha has done that. As it happens, the Third Circuit said that this restriction did pass strict scrutiny. That question is not before us, but obviously uh, Pennsylvania courts, as well as the Third Circuit, can decide in any particular case how to apply the statute that the state legislature has indeed enacted to give extra protection for religious observers. I'd also add that, of course, the free speech clause uh, uh, both as to the freedom of speech affirmatively as, uh, and as to freedom from speech compulsions, as with the Hurley, the parade case, and the freedom of expressive association, as with Boy Scouts and versus Dale, does secure considerable rights to people to, um, uh, right. to uh, 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 decide what to say and what not to say, what speech not to create, even based on race, religion, sexual orientation and such especially when they're doing it themselves. What it doesn't do, what neither the free speech clause nor the free exercise clause would do, I would say, is uh, allow people to insist that the government, when a government kind of delegates this government authority to them, they can, they can um, uh, exercise that authority the way they want and the way they think is right as opposed to the way the government. And what am I worried about in this kind of situation? I'm worried about the same thing that Justice Scalia was worried about. That if the court does say, oh, employment division versus Smith was wrong, then we'll be back to case after case in which courts have to decide just how compelling is the interest and not just as to narrow areas like free speech, let's say, or right to bear arms, which are expressly secured by the constitution, but as to exemptions from a vast, vast range of laws, so long as somebody has a, has a uh, sincere religious belief. Uh, I think that's something that the court rightly avoided, again, as a constitutional matter in Smith, and I don't want to see it get back to that. Thank you. Stephen Casey is our next question asker. Oh, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Judge Elrod and, and Jordan and, and, and uh, Eugene for your participation. I'm a huge fan of all three of y'all. So uh, 
what I see missing in the conversation and, and from, from, from both sides is this idea of where the, the, social, the social contract arises, right? So in the context of adoption, I don't see the court's reasoning from this perspective. That didn't fall out of the sky on a, on a group of, you know, 50 or 60, 18 year olds who are old enough to consent to start a society. So when government intervenes or government has a standard such as we want adoption to be here, I think the eye always has to be asked in a presuppositional and more fundamental question of what's the role of government. And so if the role of government is 18 year old, 18 year old, then I'm probably going to be the, 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 the wildest edge of libertarianism possible. But if it, the role of government starts off that many families form a clan, many clans form a tribe and anything internal to that is all kind of tradition and oral. But then from tribe to tribe, you get these formal agreements, which seems that's the nature of a constitution from disparate people groups, from people from Tennessee and people from Maine. Then the fundamental role of government is to protect the pre-governmental institution of family. So let's ask the question then, in this context, what is this religious objector doing that's toward or away from the pre-governmental institution of family? If they say, look, we're going to raise this child in this context, that does nothing to harm it. And so they should have the capacity and the freedom to do so. And, and that, that will solve, I think, a lot of questions. On okay, Stephen, I think we, I hate to interrupt you because you're so kind, uh, but uh, I think we got the gist of it about what, you know, what, what comes first and the origin of, of how w the beginning of this. Um, Jordan, did you want to talk about that? Um, I have to admit that I have not thought about this a whole lot, uh, the, 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 the way that he's putting this. Uh, I, I do think that we have a situation here, and maybe I'm, I'm missing the point that he was making, where there's some sort of family failure, that there's abuse or neglect of the children. I mean, I, I think as a general idea, if, if we're talking about having, uh, you know, mediating institutions that are non-governmental, that, you know, society works better if we have, you know, a small government and strong families and strong churches and other civic institutions. Uh, I, I basically agree with that. W what I'm having trouble here is applying it is if you're having family, f a failure where the parents are not raising the kids, uh, what do you do? Now, I know in some of these foster situations, they have kinship care where they, they want to place the children that are being abused or neglected with family members. And maybe this is getting way more specific than what he was talking about. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't exist. So I'm not exactly sure how the concept, at least applied to this situation, would, would resolve it or, or be helpful in advancing the analysis. And maybe Eugene, who's much smarter than me, We'll have some thoughts on that. <laughs> well, the Constitution does not enact any particular view about foster care. Uh, I mean, I think Jordan believes that that it enacts a view about how religious institutions may participate in that. But setting aside that question, the pre-exercise clause question, it doesn't doesn't implement any such view. Now, the court has held that the Constitution secures the rights of biological parents. Uh, that's that dates back to Meyer v. Nebraska and Pierce v. Uh, Society of Sisters. Uh, that that definitely is well founded in American legal history. Uh, but there is no constitutional right to adoption. There is no constitutional right to foster care. If the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania wants to run its foster care system in a particular way, uh, I I the, the theories that we heard are plausible theories for how you might want to run it, but nothing in the Constitution mandates that. Uh, certainly nothing in the U.S. Constitution. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has its own constitution, which is older than the U.S. Constitution. Uh, and maybe the, something can be found in it that requires that. But I don't see how the Bill of Rights uh, uh, or any other feature of the U.S. Constitution requires to, us to have that kind of conception of uh, uh, foster uh, family structure. So I think the question had a natural law flavor. That there's right, something right. that comes before the Constitution. So. Well, nothing requires Pennsylvania to adhere to some contested vision of natural law. Okay. Um, Randall Hood. You're Hi. on, Randall. Um, 
First off, I was wondering where the government got the authority to open such an office or create such an office when, in fact, are they not prohibited by the general welfare clause, both in the promote the general welfare and provide I'm the general I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I read, I read your, your comment in the chat. This is the state government. It's, it's not the federal government. It's not a question here of federal government. Promote the general welfare. And in the promote the general welfare, it states that the creation of, or new increase in creation of offices is prohibited when coupled with the Ninth Amendment, which states that you cannot deny or disparage a right in the Constitution that is by the people, which means on the side of the people, which means where the people lose authority to the government, it cannot be created. Um, I think so we I have your question. You want to know where the government has the power to enact this law. And so uh, I think we have your question. Um, would, would anyone like to address that? Well, I, I think the answer is, the states have plenary power to do those things that there's not forbidden by the federal constitution. Now, again, if you think that there's a specific enumerated right or even unenumerated right that limits, uh, that limits the government's authority about how to run the foster care system, well, we'd have to kind of explain why that would be so. There's certainly not a precedent for it that I know of. But unlike the federal government, which is a government of enumerated powers where Congress has to point to particular provision, um, as to state governments, at least under the federal constitution, they can they they can do all sorts of things, including uh, deal with foster care. And if you're going to be dealing with foster care, then you have to decide who it is uh, who uh, who selects who can provide foster care and what rules they must follow and so select. Thank you. Uh, Constantine Politis, or Politis. Thank you. Um, so as you guys discussed under Smith, the law or the city's actions here isn't neutral or generally applicable if you have a system of individualized exemptions for comparable uh, secular conduct. And here, and this came up a little bit, like the city is telling parents with disabilities that they can't serve as foster parents or, and they allow exemptions for any reason. And then I think they allow agencies, I believe, to take into account ethnicity. Um, so it seems like some of those exemptions or waivers bring in the conduct that is actually protected under the city's fair practice ordinance, um, which they kind of, the city of Philadelphia is basing their kind of reason to no, no longer want to partner with CSS off of originally. Um, so I was wondering, has the city kind of undermined their own interest here and is a law really generally and neutrally applicable when they're not even following their own fair practice ordinance, uh, at least arguably not? Thank you. I, I think you're correct. And what you're saying is, is that they, they are under their own law that they say they're subject to using the very criteria to place the children, uh, use, you know, looking at race, religion, marital status, all these forbidden categories that they're doing this. And I think under Smith, under the, the individualized exemption portion, they have to explain why they can't extend that to the religious people. Now, uh, if they're saying something like, well, we're doing it for benign reasons and they're doing it for kind of more invidious reasons or something like this, it's at a different place in the, in the process or something like this. Then I go back to what Justice Kennedy said in both the Burgerfell and in Masterpiece Cake Shop where he's basically calling these beliefs, uh, uh, you know, decent and honorable and looking for some sort of, you know, mutual coexistence, peaceful coexistence that's going on here. And, and I, I, I think uh, it, it significantly undercuts uh, the governmental interest asserted by the city of Philadelphia in this case. So according to the city, uh, the only time they've used race, and I think this covers ethnicity, uh, uh, it was in one situation where a child in city custody had used particular racial slurs and the city therefore avoided placing that child in a family with members of the race he had insulted. It seems to me that, that whatever, whatever uh, mileage you might get out of a situation where indeed there's sort of case every day, case by case, we'll give an exemption for this, exemption for that, uh, whatever mileage might be gotten in that situation, this kind of very unusual 
and well justified uh, uh, exception if this in fact was unusual and that's what Neil Katyal as lawyer for the city assured the court uh, that, uh, that that can't be enough. Another example I think is that they do consider disability of a parent uh, but that's in part because in certain situations a parent's disability might make it's hard for the a foster parent may make it hard for them to actually do the job of foster parenting, either in general or as to a particular child. So we have a few situations, it seems to be, at least according to the city's assurances, maybe they're false, but it seems to be that we have a few situations where in trying to find foster families that really are a good fit for the child, they consider factors that normally they would not be allowed to consider. That I don't think is a pervasive case-by-case uh, uh, -case decision-making process like the way the court characterized the unemployment compensation system. Can I just comment on that? Is that uh, I, I think uh, Neil Katyal, who I've worked with on some cases uh, together with, and I have great respect for, I think was not doing justice in explaining the record which I was looking at. And I, now I think that those discrete examples that you brought up, this, that's what they were talking about. But I think it's way more pervasive than that. So when there is, uh, and, it, and this is the way I would put it. So there are a child or children that need to be placed into foster care. They're looking for a match that is in the best interest of the child. To, that's basically what's more familiar and, and, and won't be, you know, like an alien social environment. So are, are the family that's being proposed, are they of the same race? Are they the same religion? Well, these are Jewish kids. Well, we want to put them with a Jewish family. We, we, you know, things like this. So they're using these criteria of race and religion, for example, to place the children when they're matching them with a family. And it's just not in these isolated cases like Neil was talking about in the oral arguments. And I think it happens all the time. And I think it makes sense. And it's not crazy or bad or anything like that or evil for them to do that. But under the, the kind of the, the formal legal argument that the city was making, they're, they're blatantly acting illegally under their Fair Practices Act by doing that. And, and that's what I think is the issue uh, that they, they have to then say, well, then why can't we grant it a similar exemption to the, to the Catholic social services? And I would say in the way that they were doing it, where they just refer the same-sex couple to another agency. I realize that that's different than what the city's doing, but the city is actually violating their own law that they say they're bound by by what they do. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more question. And the next person up is Hal Elrod. And I guess I should say in full disclosure that I think that that is my husband who is not a lawyer, so. Yeah, I, I am, however, a big, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, all three of you. So, so um, uh, uh, Mr. Lawrence, you, you mentioned, you know, that your ideal output out a scenario would be, you know, kind of overturning Smith or relooking at Smith. And, you know, in the last term, Supreme Court had the Espinoza case, which um, uh, overturned Blaine amendments, which were, you know, kind of these anti-Catholic uh, state uh, school funding amendments uh, that were passed earlier in the 19th, uh, 20th century. Mm -hmm. And, and, and um, I just, I don't know if there's a parallel again, I'm not being a lawyer, but is there a trend towards the court maybe taking an increasingly um, a skeptical look at state's limits on religious or around discretion uh, around a religious Liberty, uh, either cities or States uh, where uh, maybe that in the past, that was, that was more flexible around that. Uh, well, th this is the way that I, I would talk about this, is that um, uh, I think religious liberty cases come in a different, sometimes different categories. And so, for example, you can have a freedom of speech case, like Eugene mentioned. You can have a church autonomy on their internal governance, and those are somewhat different. And uh, you can have an, a request for an exemption kind of religious liberty case. That's what we have here. That's what we had in Hobby Lobby, uh, uh, the, the, some, uh, some other cases like that. And I think that Espinosa and these other cases are more equal treatment cases, which 
it doesn't quite fit in the, the scenario of an exemption case. So when the government says, we have a duty under our state constitution's Blaine Amendment, state establishment clause, to single out the religious users and say, you're excluded. That to me is a different kind of question that's being asked than in Fulton, which is, can you get an exemption? And because they're using a deliberate religious category, so it wouldn't fit under Smith. It's, it's, there's, it's not neutral. They're saying uh, everybody can get this uh, $150 uh, tax credit unless you're donating to one that gives to religious schools. Well, that, that wouldn't even fall under Smith. So these equal treatment things, I think, are different than the exemption type cases. And maybe Eugene could say it better than I just did. <laughs> Uh, no, I entirely agree with you uh, that, uh, and I have long uh, supported the view that the court uh, endorsed in Espinoza that uh, the that um, uh, the free exercise clause prevents the government from discriminating against religion. You can't say we will fund scholarships. Let's say Montana is more complicated than that, but let's let's take a stylized example. We can't uh, fund uh, uh, scholarships. Uh, we won't fund scholarships at religious schools, even though we do fund them at private secular schools. That's discrimination against religion. Free exercise clause prohibits that. The question is: the free exercise clause mandate a certain kind of discrimination in favor of religion? Does it mandate the exemption of religious institutions and individuals from generally applicable laws? There, I think, just as Scalia who also, by the way, said uh, in an earlier case, the Free Exercise Clause forbids discrimination against religion. I think in Smith, Justice Scalia got it right, that the Free Exercise Clause also does not mandate discrimination in favor of religion. Why, thank you. Gentlemen, do you have any final thoughts tonight? I, I, I will just say that I think this is an opportunity for the Supreme Court that uh, to, I, I just think if the people, uh, as we have this cultural conflict over same-sex marriage, I think if people believe that there's safe spaces that are carved out where they can uh, express their opinions, et cetera, without penalty, participate in society, at least at some level, not every situation is gonna be the same that we evaluate them. I think we bring more peace to the situation. But if they are feeling like all their safe spaces are being overrun, uh, I, I don't think that's a good situation for resolve, a, a good way to resolve this whole cultural question. So I actually agree with that. I, and sometimes I think it's even these spaces are constitutionally mandated, say by the free speech clause in certain situations. Yes. I just don't think they're inst constitutionally mandated when the government is essentially asking people to give it advice about where to place uh, children in foster homes uh, and is implementing conditions that says, if you're going to have your advice listened to, you've got to follow our rules. That is an area where I think the government can say, this is our program, our rules, and that's that. Well, this was a very civilized fight night, um, very erudite fight. Um, I hope that uh, people learned about this case and about um, religious liberties and, and this topic. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Cole. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, that does it for tonight, everyone. Uh, it was a different event than we planned, but I think the conversation was still quite good. Uh, so a special thanks to Jordan Lawrence for taking the time out of his schedule to participate. Of course, to Judge Elrod for serving as a thoughtful moderator, to the FedSoc Student Division for helping pull this all together, and of course, to Professor Volokh for stepping into the arena on such short notice. Uh, thank you to all of our viewers here, whether you're on Zoom or viewing through YouTube or Twitter. Be sure to keep your eyes peeled for the next Fetty Night Fight, which I'm told will be Festivus themed. Thanks again, and on behalf of the Columbia Law School Federal Society chapter, have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>